Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 296, recorded on June 7th, 2023. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. Canonical has updated the world on their efforts to use Ubuntu Core as an immutable Linux desktop base. They start by reminding us that the development of Ubuntu Core began way back in 2014, focusing, at the time, on a fully containerized IoT platform. And Ubuntu for IoT devices made a lot of sense. I mean, you want a resilient system in those environments, and you want individual parts to be updatable cleanly, independently. And it generally means that you can trust that the applications you've installed can't see each other's data unless you allow them to. And of course, you can mix and match versions in a way that you can't with traditional Linux, and you can roll back if things go wrong. Well, gosh, when you put it that way, I want that on my desktop too. Yeah, I think that's what Canonical's thinking too. And they point out that it's a little bit trickier with desktop software to containerize it up than say like server or IoT software because we want our desktop apps to work well together. And that tight integration makes it more challenging to define the sandbox boundaries between applications and system components in a way that is secure, but also easy to use. Well, don't you know, Canonical happens to have just the right solution for that problem. Snaps. Although snaps are a little famous for having a few rough edges. Yeah, even Canonical admits that, and I agree. They say, quote, they are excited to explore the idea of fully containerized desktop where each component is immutable and isolated. Then they go on to say that, quote, we have steadily been improving the experience of desktop snaps. And in due course, we think that the entire system can be delivered this way. We'll be excited to offer a version of the Ubuntu desktop with these new capabilities. They also acknowledge other well-known Linux distributions undertaking immutable desktop projects, and then go on to detail some of the advantages they foresee. Yeah, there's nothing too surprising in there. The one that caught my attention, I thought it was interesting that they called out swapping desktop environments quickly and cleanly. I love, I just love this about Nix because I can move between Plasma and Gnome, and it was like neither one was ever on the system after I'm done switching. And it's possible that with Ubuntu Core, Canonical could make that experience even smoother and more straightforward with Ubuntu Core's design. Now, all those exciting things out of the way, this level of stability and security does come with a few trade-offs, especially for developers and system tinkerers. Restricting modifications of the base operating system in favor of a just-works experience. Canonical says some of that can be mitigated for developers using container-based environments, similar to the LexD-based Christini. Yeah, some of that. Um, and for Tinkers, it sounds like they plan to keep those classic Ubuntu images around that we use today uh, for those of us who want to have that complete control and responsibility for their system. So we don't know a lot. We know these are kind of their ambitions. These are the goals and advantages that Canonical sees. But they tell us that over the next few months, we should see some updates on this project. So we'll keep an eye out and update you if anything of note develops. Red Hat announced this week that they will stop shipping LibreOffice in future Red Hat Enterprise Linux releases, as well as limiting Red Hat's engagement in working on LibreOffice packaging for Fedora. Yeah, presumably this will take place around the Red Hat Enterprise Linux 10 timeframe. They weren't very specific, though. Instead, Red Hat plans to rely on Flatpak for LibreOffice deployment. And, you know, while that individual decision may or may not seem like a good one to any one of us out here, um, I suppose you can't help but interpret this as Red Hat electing to invest a bit less in the Linux desktop. I think it's just a nature of resources, really. The display systems team at Red Hat has been dedicated to enhancing Wayland, to implementing HDR support on the Linux desktop, and a, a, just a bunch of other crucial projects to improve the user experience for workstation users. But that focus is coming with a trade-off. To prioritize these initiatives, the team will reduce their desktop application development efforts. The team at Red Hat will still maintain LibreOffice in RHEL 7, 8, and 9, with the necessary security fixes for the lifetime of those releases. And we'll also work on upstream improvements to LibreOffice itself so that it works a little better as a flat pack. And, of course, last of all, any community member could, in theory, step up and maintain the LibreOffice RPMs in Fedora if they like a challenge. 
It's been a few weeks since we had a big update on the efforts to bring Linux to Apple's new SOCs. And recently, the Asahi team shared several improvements and milestones. One of the first significant improvements shipping is the new CPU idle driver, which has been added to reduce idle power consumption and improve battery runtime, especially on M1 Pro and Max machines. And to go along with that, the proper function of S2 idle has been enabled, which fixes timekeeping issues and prevents crashes in journal D. Hey, that seems like a great thing to see. Also, CPU boost states are now enabled for single and low-threaded workloads, which the project says results in a noticeable improvement in single-core performance. And thermal throttling is now enabled, which keeps the thermals in check, especially on those fanless models. And now the thermal management operates more like the behavior in macOS, which prevents overheating. As far as hardware support goes, base support for M2 Pro Max and Ultra SoCs has been added to the kernel, with full hardware support expected soon. Just some fantastic results we're seeing land this time around. Yeah, they're they're catching up. We might have full M2 support before the M3 series. It's great to see that progress. Uh, I know that's got to be hard. And if you're running Asahi on a machine like I am, you're going to want to update after you hear this. The graphics drivers are getting one of their biggest upgrades the project has done. They are, quote, leapfrogging OpenGL 2.1 over OpenGL 3.0 right to 3.1. And the OpenGL ES 2.0 support is getting bumped all the way up to 3.0. These upgrades pull in all kinds of functionalities like multiple render targets, multi-sampling, transform feedback, texture buffer objects, and more. The ultimate objective in all this graphics work is to develop a Vulkan driver that's capable of running modern games. And while this goal is still some distance away to be sure, it's worth noting that the basic requirements for Vulkan 1.0 align with those of OpenGL ES 3.1. So that work being done now can be directly applied to Vulkan. As a quick example, the multi-sampling compiler passes Chris mentioned earlier, well, those are implemented as shared code across the drivers. So having tested them now with OpenGL, they're basically prepared for deployment in the upcoming Vulkan environment. Linode.com slash LAN. Head over there to get $100 in 60-day credit and learn about the exciting news. Linode is now part of Akamai. All the developer-friendly tools, including that cloud manager, the API, the command line tool, they're all there to help you build, deploy, and scale in the cloud. But now, combined with Akamai's power and global research, they're expanding their services to give you more resources and more tools while still giving you that classic, reliable, affordable, and scalable solution for individuals and businesses of all sizes. And as part of Akamai's global network of offerings, data centers are going to be expanding. They're investing big, giving you access to even more resources to help you grow your business and serve your customers. So don't wait. Go experience the power of Linode now, Akamai. Visit linode.com slash LAN to learn how Linode, now Akamai, can help scale your applications from the cloud to the edge. That $100 lets you really kick the tires. Go support the show and visit linode.com slash L-A-N. And thank you to Collide. Collide.com slash LAN. Collide can help Okta users achieve 100% fleet compliance. If a device isn't compliant, the user can't log in to your cloud applications until they fix the problem. And the moment Collide's agent does detect a problem, it alerts the user and gives them instructions on how to fix it. If they don't fix the problem within a set time, they're blocked. It's that simple. Collide's solution ensures device compliance as part of authentication, which not only reduces support tickets and IT frustration, but ensures 100% compliance. Learn more or book a demo at collide.com slash LAN. Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference is running this week, and they've low-key buried in the session for developers on their website an effort to bring Windows games to the Mac. And welcome. My name is Aishwarya, and I'm very excited to talk to you about bringing your game to the Mac. The surprising news here is Apple is using Wine 
to enable DirectX 12 games to run on top of Metal. Quite similar to how Proton brings DirectX games to Vulkan. Even more interesting, no one at the Wine Project or Code Weavers, the largest contributor to Wine, was aware of this effort. From the Code Weavers blog, quote, We are ecstatic that Apple chose to use Crossover's source code as their emulation solution for the game porting toolkit. We have decades of experience creating ports with Wine, and we're very pleased that Apple is recognizing that Wine is a fantastic solution for running Windows games on macOS. Well, before we get too excited, I am going to pump the brakes just a little bit. Here's how Apple conceives and describes this game environment. Porting your Windows game to the Mac is now faster than ever. This year, the new Game Porting Toolkit provides an emulation environment to run your existing, unmodified Windows game, and you can use it to quickly understand the graphics feature usage and performance potential of your game when running on a Mac. Yeah, I think the tell is in the name. It's a game porting toolkit, not a one-to-one alternative to Proton on the Mac. However, it is still Wine under the hood. When you hear Apple describe it, they describe Wine, but without exactly saying it. The environment of the game porting toolkit translates your game's Intel instructions and its use of Windows APIs for keyboard, mouse, and controller input for audio playback, for networking and file system use, and of course, for graphics. All modern graphics features, such as GPU-driven pipelines and SIMD operations, and even older features, such as tessellation and geometry shaders, are translated. I agree with your take, Wes. Uh, This is a, quote, getting started tool, so developers can start seeing results when they're trying to port a Windows game to the Mac immediately. And it's all designed to help them along their journey to port to Apple's native APIs. It's not really meant for, say, an enthusiast like me right now who might be using Asahi Linux and totally willing to reboot into Mac OS if it means I could run a wine game that's from Windows and works great with the Apple hardware. Um, I'm not sure how possible that will be. Maybe we will see community-created apps in the next few days that take advantage of this environment. We did some testing, even with the current release. You don't have to be on Sonoma. You can get some progress. But right now, it's really just focused on optimizing for debugging. After installing the toolkit, they copy a Windows build of the medium to their Mac and launch it from a terminal. As it launches in the game porting toolkit's translation environment, Logging and debug information appears in the terminal. When you launch your game, this logging may include potential issues for you to address. Apple's official documentation instructs developers to use the Brew Package Manager to get the game porting toolkit installed. It also includes instructions for applying their custom brew formula, which patches upstream wine. It is quite the process. It feels like the old days with Linux when we had 32-bit and 64-bit environments because when you set this up on the Mac, you have to go into an x86 Rosetta terminal environment. Then you have to install the x86 version of Brew and all of the dependencies you need to make this wine environment work, including things like GStreamer and lots of Python. I mean, it's depending on the speed of your internet and the speed of your Mac, it could be an hour's worth of stuff installing and and building. So uh, you got to really keep that in mind if you want to play around with this. And it's, it's just so classic Apple here what they did, because heaven forbid they have to touch the GPL with any of this, right? So, so they did all of this, like you said, Wes, in a brew formula, just to avoid the proper upstreaming and touching the GPL. But it does make it accessible to all of us. Yeah, in some sense, it's almost hard to believe this is just in a GitHub repo out there. But it also really means that Wine has reached that sort of ultimate stage for a free software project, where they get adopted by some of the world's largest companies, and then just embedded as a feature. Maybe, hopefully, Apple will kick a little value back up to the Wine project for all this. Yeah, and if nothing else... Maybe just don't hassle code weavers if they bake this into a future crossover product. And and maybe don't go after the community if they start using this to run Steam games or make apps so you can point this at anything and run it. Let, let people play, Apple. Just let them play. 
We'll keep an eye on everything that goes on here and, of course, everything else happening in the world of Linux and open source. So don't miss a single episode. Go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact to let us know which Windows games you got working. (laughs) And did you know the Linux Fest call for speakers has been extended to June 25th? If you haven't got a talk submitted and you were thinking about it, you have a few days left. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. As for us, don't worry. We'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. Mm